as we continue our introduction to indigenous resource management, I want to spend a little bit of time um, talking about verbiage, and then we'll do a brief overview of all the topics we're going to touch on. And that serves as an, as an entry point um, as you think about what uh, projects you might want to take on for the final paper. Um, it's important um, to be sure that we're using active voice when we talk about in indigenous people, not they used to fish salmon. It's Coast Salish people are fishing salmon. Um, that, you know, we'll be reading a lot of literature that's based on interviews and based on something that happened in the past. And so you'll hear a lot of past tense, but I want to be sure that we're using present tense. Um, you know, we could argue that there are certain practices that maybe aren't aren't as prevalent as they are, you know, are not as prevalent now as they were 500 years ago. But we don't really know, right? It's not our judgment to say that you indigenous people used to do these things, but now you don't, right? That knowledge and practices is still alive, um, and it's not part of this course or within, I think, our rights to judge that, to pass um, tense on that, to say what people are and are not doing, right? Uh, so be sure we keep present voice. Um, we'll slip up, I'll slip up, but just make sure that we set that intention. And something that I'll try to correct as well in your papers and your reports that um, we're trying to use active and present tense as much, much as possible. Coast Salish people reef net fish. Not every Coast Salish person is out reef net fishing every year, but it's still integral, it's still alive, and we want the language to reflect that. Um, so think about that. Um, I also will spend a little bit of time later looking at this uh, indigenous health indicator, but I encourage you to look at this website. It's uh, swinomish.nsn gov slash IHI indigenous health indicator. This is really cool work by Jamie Donawatu and um, Larry Campbell and I actually have a link to Northwest Indian College and they've got the Salish Sea speaker series there and Jamie and Larry did a um, joint Salish Sea speaker series for us three years ago maybe four years ago. Um, really great work and so what this work is doing is it's looking at how environmental change impacts indigenous health, which goes beyond uh, traditional health indices, blood pressure, things like that. Uh, the one piece that uh, one piece I want to mention right now, which I think is important, is under resilience, their sustainability. Um, and I would argue that they really are talking about resilience here. But under sustainability, it says culture isn't sta stagnant, it adapts, e.g., People hunt with guns, use motorboats today, but that doesn't discount the significance of harvesting. But preserving the ability to move within homelands and voluntarily adopt, ad adapt to changes, temporal or permanent, um, is important. And so what that quote's saying is just because, um, not just because, what it's saying is that you can't put indigenous people in a box and say, okay, if you want to be indigenous and do indigenous based harvest, you got to use the original technologies. You are not allowed to adapt and adopt new, new technologies as they come out. You must stay in the museum glass and never, never move beyond that. That what this is saying is that if you go out and use a modern firearm or you use a, a nylon net, it doesn't make your harvest any less sacred, any less important, any less part of who you are. Um, and so I think that's a really important piece to think about as, as we move forward. Um, another thing that often comes up is this idea of the, the noble savage, uh, which is a character who, due to their race or ethnicity, um, a member of a barbaric or savage tribe uh, or a group simply perceived as such by others and because of it portrayed as nobler or of higher moral fiber than the norm. So think about Avatar. Um, that 
people are um, kind of put into this noble savage um, caricature where they didn't harm the environment because they didn't know how or things like that. Um, and when we're talking about indigenous resource management, um, there's a lot of trial and error that's, that's been involved over many generations. Um, and this is a, a body of knowledge that comes from both the spiritual side and from interacting with the environment for since time immemorial for thousands and thousands of years. And so uh, we just need to be careful we're not creating these caricatures. Um, additionally, I think it's often glossed over is there's real hardships. Life was hard. Um, I think we tend to romanticize the past, um, both for indigenous people and um, and settlers that uh, kind of you know harken back to these days of simplicity and everything was so simple and straightforward. Life was hard. Life was very very hard. Um, things were difficult. Uh, There's lots of things that happened that were very unpleasant. Um, so just kind of keeping this in mind that we don't want to start constructing these noble savage uh, caricatures in our mind. The first part of this class, and actually we return to it a, a few times throughout the course, is a really great book edited by Doug Dewar and Nancy Turner, um, two absolute greats. Um, I've never met Doug, but I know Nancy very well. Um, and she actually gave a speaker, she presented here a... Uh, Maybe last winter, it'll be on the Western on the Huxley site uh, under the speaker series. Uh, there's a video of, of her presentations, well worth checking out. Um, and this book, Keep, Keeping It Living, um, is great. I, I, I've, I just moved offices, I don't know where my copy is. Um, I think they're $10, $15 on Amazon, maybe more, you can check. It's worth picking up. Uh, Western also has digital rights, and so I've got the PDF uh, of the entire book under the Keeping It Living folder, and I've assigned a number of readings uh, from this book as well, because Western has digital rights to it. So uh, so that's great. So again, there's not a required textbook for this class, uh, but if you really like this um, material and you really like um, ethnocology, ethnobotany, this is like the, one of the found, foundational books, and so it's well worth putting in your library. And again, I think think it can be had for very little money on Amazon, but I haven't actually looked uh, today. Uh, and we'll start off about how the view of Northwest Coast people's engagement in agriculture slash plant cultivation has changed. Really one of the foundations of the book in this course is thinking of indigenous people as ecosystem managers, that more than passive participants in the environment. And so we'll talk about the hunter-gatherer paradigm, uh, this idea that there was this um, Eden-esque landscape when the first explorers uh, came on the scene. Uh, they talk about the landscape as, you know, these, you know shaped by God and these beautiful um, gardens that were um, likened to the be most beautiful English gardens. And really, they were really struck by the landscape, and, and our landscape is still very beautiful today. But what they failed to acknowledge and recognize is that that landscape did not happen by accident. That landscape, um, and this, we can debate the definition of natural, but that landscape did not happen in the absence of human intervention. Um, and so because that human intervention looked different than the traditional European wheat farm, it wasn't recognized as agriculture. Um, and that's led to um, a lot of issues that we're still struggling with today as far as the view of how indigenous people interact with the landscape and how they belong on the landscape. Um, and Nancy has been a real leader in um, helping right that wrong. And I, I think her work in particular, uh, and many others, um, is a real testament to this. Uh, so here's a quote from Turner et al. 2013. Uh, but see, people didn't believe that we did this. They think that nature just grows on its own. A lot of people felt to get more harvest and bigger uh, berries, 
they did these things. Same thing a farmer does. Uh, this is a quote from Dr. Daisy Seward Smith, uh, who's clock a walk, um, and talking about how her people um, actively engaged in the ecosystem, actively managed um, these plants, actively cultivated them. Uh, but to the untrained eye, um, arguably with some, some racial layers, um, did not view this interaction with the landscape as something positive or as uh, cultivation, um, something that rises to um, what at that time people defined as cultivation. So that's a major theme we'll take throughout the class. Uh, it's worth spending some time kind of in, th in that concept. Another major theme in this class we'll talk about um, that you can choose to use for your final project as well as uh, reef net fishing. Um, I'm a big fan of reef net fishing. Um, we normally go out and visit. Uh, we've, we've often taken this class out to go visit the gear. There's some modern reef net gear off Lummi Island, uh, Shaw, Lopez. There's been some off Stewart, um, off Henry Island, Deepwater Bay. A mix of native and non-native uh, people operating the gear. Most of the gears right now is operated by non-native uh, people who've adopted that technology. Um, we'll take a kind of deeper dive in like what that looks like and what that means. Um, but people have recognized that this is one of the most eco-friendly, sustainable ways of harvesting salmon and getting the highest quality product and the quality relates to price. Um, and as salmon populations dwindle, you know, one way to make them economically sustainable is get more money per fish. And reef net fishing is a great way of doing that. Um, another topic we'll, we'll delve into is a watershed view. And we talked about the Salish Sea as a watershed. Um, and really, what does that mean in the context of ecosystem management? Um, and I think there's some really great examples and some, some cool thoughts of if we want the sea to be healthy, if we want to be able to go out and dig clams and not get sick, we can't just look at the seawater. We need to look at the watershed and how are those integrated and how have these modifications gone from mountaintop to seafloor bottom. And so really having a more integrated view um, is an aspect we'll, we'll bring throughout the, the class. Uh, we'll spend some time on, on some part of my academic background uh, and personal love is bivalves, clams. And so we'll spend some time talking about clam preparation, um, some of the issues with harmful algal blooms, uh, bacteria, things like that, um, and sort of how clams are preserved and, and stored. And so uh, we're, I try to bring examples in this class from terrestrial and marine. I have a massive marine bias in my um, in my background, but I'm working to learn more of the terrestrial. Uh, and here's, here's the agriculture sort of in quotes, the Coast Salish agriculture. So this is a really cool diagram. Uh, this is based loosely on Hoyat, which is um, in Heltzik territory. So north of the Salish Sea, uh, Heltzik territory is north of Vancouver Island, kind of in and east of Haida Gwaii. Um, and in this section, I was with, this is Darcy Matthews and Nancy Turner. Um, I was with Darcy and Nancy uh, when we all went up to Hoya and started mapping out this area. And it's it's just one of these areas that when you look at it with the untrained eye, you're like, oh, I don't know, it's cool. It's like a little inlet. It's, it's, there's some stuff there. We start looking more closely and you see stonefish traps, you see a clam garden, you see berry gardens, you see estuarine root gardens, you start to see massive amounts of modification. Um, it's really, really, really interesting. So we'll spend time looking at the Hoyt website that, that breaks us down. But this idea of, of Coast Salish agriculture can go many different directions, and it's something that perhaps you might want to develop for your final project. Um, there's some specific um, acorn and nut work. Um, in the Northwest, our only native oak is the Gary Oak, and they're way down in population. They're about 5% of their traditional range. Um, I can provide some guidance on where to go look for them. 
um, and where to collect them. Uh, it's usually sort of October time is the, is the right time to collect them. Um, if, if it's around October, um, they're worth collecting. Um, and if I'm able to, I'll try to get some and bring them in um, and make them available if students want to come in and grab some Gary Oak acorns and we can talk about how to process them. Um, and, and there's some directions we can go to that. But the really cool thing about Gary Oaks um, is one, oaks are used up and down you know, the west coast. A lot of California tribes use a lot of acorns. There's less known up here. Um, and it's been kind of an interesting story and I, I don't fully understand it. Um, some argue that with the um, proliferation of camas, oak harvest, uh, acorn harvest became less. Um, but it is a, a good source of protein. It's a good it's a good food source, um, and they're relatively easy to process. I've processed both Gary oaks um, and then the non-native uh, European red oak. Um, there's a bunch of oaks actually on College Way, kind of in, in that part of College Way that has the median kind of Iceum High. Um, and then at uh, Hovander Park in Ferndale, there's a ton of big old oaks. And you can go out there and readily pick up tons of acorns. Those acorns are a lot bitter, more bitter, um, and the shells are harder. Uh, Gary Oaks have a thinner shell and the meat's more tender. Um, so I'd like to get some and... and uh, um, I'll process it, and if folks that are interested, we can we can talk about talk about that. Camas is really cool. Um, I would love to be able to harvest camas, um, and we're working towards that. There's actually a, a small camas patch behind environmental the environmental studies building, often referred to as environmental science building, but the the ugly concrete building, the ES. In Arnson, there's a little garden back there, with raised garden plots, and there's uh, near the stairwell that goes down the parking lot. There's a bunch of tall, kind of funny-looking trees. Um, uh, I forget it's a it's a Asian cypress. Um, we looked it up once, but below that, uh, there's a whole bunch of camas that was planted there, um, near as I can tell, on the order of thirty some years ago, um, and through um, a variety of courses, we've been trying to clean that area up and help cultivate camas. So camas, these little bulbs, they're arguably as important or more important than salmon. Um, and we'll talk about why people might not have heard of camas um, and do, do a bit of work on that. Lots of, about camas. Camas are super, super cool. It's, it's one's well worth diving into for a final project. Uh, medicinal, medicinal plants, um, this can go in lots of different ways. There's so many plants that have medicinal qualities. Um, I'll talk about a few, but for sure people can go deeper. And if, we, if you go deeper for medicinal plants on your final project, I would encourage you to really also get in the scientific literature. You're going to find lots of blog posts saying, Blank is good for toxins. Blank is good for um, stomach issues. Blank is good for inflammation. That's fine at the surface, but for a scientific report, I want the underlying compounds that are that um, lead to those qualities. And there is some literature on that. It takes a bit to dive in and get there, but it's there. And so. Um, you'll find lots of service level stuff, um, but what I really want is has there been work done on the specific compounds within that plant that are imparting those uh, medicinal qualities. It, and it won't be around for, that information will not be available for lots of plants, but it is there for, for a fair number. Burning um, is certainly an aspect we can look at it at a variety of different ways. Uh, we'll talk about um, fire management as or fire as a management tool and there's a fair amount of evidence that light low intensity fires were lit 
on the order of four to seven years that uh, landscapes any chunk of ground ground was burnt on sort of that order of four to seven years with a with a fair amount of regularity um and that under western management has stopped and uh related to that is arguably a massive increase in wild fires um, in addition to climatic change but this buildup of fuel um, once a fire starts winds up being much more destructive compared to a landscape where low fires are lit very frequently and it cleans out the understory um, and help keeps the forest floor open and reduces the severity of massive fires. Uh, cedar, the, the tree of life, um, we'll talk a fair amount about cedar um, and uh, depending on what's available, uh, potentially be able to work with cedar. Um, here we have got Western red cedar um, and learn a bit about when Western red cedar actually kind of showed up on the scene, how that had a massive impact on culture and some of the big ecological problems facing cedar. Um, Western red cedar has been facing really low recruitment for the past roughly 25 years. And so uh, potentially there could be some, some real grave concerns about the uh, cedar's future. I'll touch a bit on mammals and also um, uh, other animal, terrestrial animal harvest, uh, both deer, elk. Um, there's a fair amount on ducks that's really cool. Um, so we'll talk a bit about that. Um, as part of this class, I've always wanted to have a video showing the breaking down of a deer. Um, that has not happened yet, um, but it, it might. Uh, happen this year we'll see um, but it's a pretty interesting process that I think most people are not familiar with um, how one goes from in a deer walking around to breaking that down into individual uh, muscles and then preparing it and resilience um, is a a framework at which we'll revisit all of these topics and so resilience can be thought of in, in a variety of analogies in a variety of ways one of which is the degree at which something can flex and then return to its original shape um, you can think about like a, a soft piece of plastic you know or that can rebound and another way of thinking about resilience is that ability to have an ecological perturbation and ecological push, wildfire, uh, drought, something like this. And then once that event is done, return back to its original state. And then often what we have are tipping points. And so if we have a massive fire, that could be a tipping point. And then five, 10, 100 years later, that ecosystem looks totally different than it did before. So if you can imagine a stable uh, old growth forest, massive fire burns it to the ground for quite a long time it's a different ecosystem it takes a long time to go from bare bare ground to an old growth forest so maybe one example of that um, so we'll kind of bring that back at the end and, and tie the idea of resilience um, as it relates to traditional technologies um, and how that relates to one, how we view our systems and then how we should be managing our systems, whether it be for the productivity of a single species or for the overall resilience of the ecosystem, which um, are a fair amount different. Uh, so, Heishka, um, thank you for uh, listening to this part of the lecture. Um, as we're getting started here, there will be lots of material, lots of new concepts, um, and I appreciate and look forward to your respectful engagement.